Well, everyone, uh, I give you a warm welcome on a, on a rather chilly evening by, uh, by Miami standards, although I've only been here about a year myself, so I'm finding it rather, uh, rather refreshing. Um, my name is Phil Harling. I'm the director of the uh, Center for the Humanities here at UM. And uh, on behalf of the center staff, uh, and in collaboration with the American Institute of Polish Culture, I'd like to welcome each of you here tonight uh, to the Kislak Center, um, particularly our honored guest the speaker tonight, the Honorable Aldona Vosch. I'd also like to welcome Beata Paschitz. Beata, where are you? Who is the executive director of the American Institute of Polish Culture, and she's worked with us very closely on events related to the uh, 2023-24 academic year program of the Lady Blanca Rosa Steele Endowed Program in Polish Culture here at UM. I'd also like to welcome our students, faculty, staff, and uh, administration at UM. Uh, all of those who, of you who came out tonight who are also affiliated with the Polish community here in Miami-Dade County, welcome to campus, welcome to this, uh, to this special event this evening. Uh, I'd also like to express my gratitude for many folks who have made this evening uh, and other uh, events related to the uh, endowed program in Polish culture possible. Uh, to our conference coordinator, Oni Dunham, who's worked very hard uh, to, to make this a special evening. Uh, my assistant director at the center, uh, uh, Christina Larson, who's right there. To our student assistants, Lyric Johnson and uh, Layla Blue Jackson Yanez, and our graduate fellow, Vanessa Rodriguez. Uh, I'd also like to thank the UM College of Arts and Sciences for their ongoing support of this series. Um, and very special thank you and gratitude to the American Institute of Polish Culture, particularly Beata, but her whole team, including Agnieszka uh, and Tom, for their dil diligent work in preparation for our program here this evening. Without any further ado, I'd like to introduce right now Nick uh, Ivaniski, who is the university archivist here at UM, who will uh, give you a little special presentation. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Phil. Uh, appreciate the introduction. Um, we would like to take a few moments to recognize Lady Blanca Rosenstiel and the late Louis Rosenstiel for their generous gifts to the American Institute of Polish Culture in Miami, which has funded this lecture series, and to the University of Miami. The Rosensteels have gifted approximately $100 million to educational institutions through the Rosensteel Foundation. We honor their magnanimity and respect the for the marine sciences with heartfelt gratitude. The University of Miami proudly carries their torch forward for world-class research and development. Uh, the University of Miami Rosensteel School of Marine, Atmospheric, and Earth Sciences houses its main campus on Virginia Key. Pictured here in a recent photograph, uh, it has grown to its current prominence, largely due to the financial support from the Rosensteel Foundation. Here is an early image from the University Archives of the Marine Laboratory. In 1956, ground was broken for the main building on Virginia Key, uh, uh, sorry, on the, on the Virginia Key campus, and this was the same year that Lady Blanca A. Rosensteel came to the United States. Lady Blanca Rosensteel was born in Warsaw, Poland. After World War II, she studied arts in Brussels. In 1967, she married the late Louis S. Rosensteel, chairman of Shenley Industries, a humanitarian and a philanthropist. In 1969, the University of Miami honored philanthropist Mr. Ro Louis Rosensteel with the dedication of the Rosensteel Medical Sciences Building of the School of Medicine and the changing of the name of the Institute of Marine Sciences to the Rosensteel School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences. This dedication honored a $12 million gift from, the, from Mr. Rosensteel, the largest single gift the university has ever received, which is now worth nearly $100,639,455 in 2023 with that inflation. <laughs> uh, President Stanford, Dr. F.G. Walton Smith, D. W. Dr. D. W. D. Dean Warren, and Mr. Rosensteel gave speeches at the Rosensteel dedication. Um, 
Lady Blanca's avid interest in the arts, dedication to helping young artists, and desire to promote Poland's heritage while fostering culture in her American homeland prompted her to establish the American Institute of Polish Culture, or AIPC, in Miami in 1972 and the Chopin Foundation in 1976. In 1998, Mrs. Rosensteel was appointed an honorary consul of the Republic of Poland uh, and making her the first Polish consul in the history of Florida. In spring 2021, uh, Lady Blanca Rosensteel endowed uh, the Lady Bro Blanca Rosensteel endowed program for Polish heritage uh, was founded at the University of Miami. This lecture series is made possible by a generous gift uh, from uh, to the University of Miami from the American Institute of Polish Culture, um, established by Lady Blanca in 1972. The AIPC shares with Americans the rich heritage of Poland, which has contributed in so many ways to the history of the United States, and promotes the scientific, scholarly, and artistic contributions of Polish Americans. The first event in this lecture series was held virtually uh, in December 2021 with an exciting presentation from Artur Himalewski, project manager of the Jet Propulsion uh, Laboratory at NASA, with an audience of nearly 100 online attendees. In October 2022, we held the inaugural in-person program for the series here at the Kislak Center with Ambassador Marek Majorowski, and we look forward to hosting many more events that honor Polish culture in the future. And behind me, there is a collage of photographs from the Rosensteel program last year. Um, and at this time, I'd like to introduce uh, Beata Pasic, uh, Pasic to uh, talk about uh, the AIPC. On behalf of Lady Blanca, who unfortunately couldn't join us today, I would like to welcome you at the University of Miami for the lecture by Ambassador Vosch on Polish and Estonian relations as part of the Blanca Rosensteel Endowed Program in Polish Heritage. This program is a result of the vision of Lady Blanca Rosensteel to promote Polish culture through cultural and educational events. She started the Institute in the 70s when Poland was still behind the Iron Curtain and today, 50 years later, our programs are thriving. So is Poland and it is a democratic country again. It is thanks to Lady Blanca's passion, dedication, financial support and true love for Poland that programs like this one enrich us and are able to be presented throughout South Florida and beyond. We are most grateful to Lady Blanca for all she has done so far. I would like to thank also you, our friends and members, for participating in today's lecture. For those who have not yet become our members, I encourage you to read some of the materials and take some of the materials we brought for you and also join the American Institute of Polish Culture. In two weeks, on November 15th, we will have another lecture with a keynote speaker of Ambassador Magierowski, the Ambassador of Poland to the United States. He'll talk at FIU at 11 o'clock, and he, his speech will talk about a new role of Poland in New Europe. We brought some flyers, I hope you take them with you. The same day, Ambassador Magierowski will open a very unique exhibition. It will be an exhibition of Polish posters never seen before in Florida, original posters from Poland from the 50s and the 80s. We will have a reception that will feature hors d'oeuvres, wine, pierogi, and vodka. So I hope all of you will come and join. Today, you are in for a special treat. Ambassador Bosch is an extraordinary woman 
highly knowledgeable. She's not only a medical doctor, but she's also a very distinguished diplomat, the president of the Institute of World Politics in Washington, D.C., a dedicated philanthropist, a passionate activist, a loving wife, a caring mother, and all around an exceptional human being. Thank you, Madam Ambassador, for gracing the University of Miami and Rosenstiel program with your presence to enlighten us all. Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is Gregory Koger. I'm a professor of political science and the director of the George P. Hanley Democracy Center at the University of Miami. Uh, the Hanley Center is a new institution on campus and it is dedica dedicated to promoting the understanding uh, of democratic self-government. Uh, I'm th thrilled to formally introduce our speaker tonight. Uh, this is a fascinating time in Polish history with the critical election in October that may shape the country's political system and foreign policy in the years to come. And I look forward to the insights of our speaker that our speaker can provide on these events in Poland's future. Our guest speaker, Ambassador Aldona Vash, uh, first earned her uh, medical doctorate at the Warsaw Medical Academy. Her career as a doctor included private practice, corporate medicine, uh, clinical care, teaching, and consulting. Uh, for both hospitals and private industry. In 2004, Ambas Ambassador Vosh uh, was appointed as a U.S. Ambassador to the Republic of Estonia. From 2013 to 2015, she served as North Carolina's Secretary uh, of the Department of Health and Human Services. In 2017, uh, President Trump appointed Ambassador Vosh as the Vice Chair of the President's Commission on White House Fellowships, and in 2020, uh, he nominated her to be the U.S. Ambassador to Canada. Dr. Vosh currently serves as President of the Institute of World Politics, where she served on the board for over 15 years. Uh, Ambassador Vosh also serves on the boards of the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation, the Council of American Ambassadors, and the University of North Carolina Wilmington, as well as on the Duke Law Board of Visitors. Uh, so, without further ado, Please, Ambassador Vaz. Uh, thank you very much, Professor, and thank you very much, Valda. That was heartfelt. So, thank you very much, and I hope I can meet everyone's expectations. So, uh, so thank you. Uh, one thing that I did request is that we have perhaps um, the, a map, and um, here we go, so that we all know what we are speaking about and where it's taking place. So uh, please feel free to refer to the, uh, to the map above. So uh, once again, a good evening. I would like to thank the American Institute of Polish Culture and Lady Blanca Rosenstiel, who I have the honor of knowing for almost 25 years, uh, for her endowed program in Polish heritage and the Center of Humanities here at the University of Miami College of Arts and Sciences. So thank you very much for, for asking me to be here. I am Aldona Walsh. I am the president of a graduate school, the Institute of World Politics in Washington, DC. It is a graduate school on national security, intelligence, and international affairs. What we say to describe the school is we teach diplomats, warriors, and spies. And that's what I do for a living currently. Uh, as far as the graduate school, we have been around for 33 years. We're accredited and re-accredited. We have seven masters, 18 graduate certificate programs, and a doctoral program in statecraft and national security. So, in addition to my current position as head of this graduate school, which is truly focused also on international affairs, I have the qualifications of addressing the topic that I've been asked to speak about, about the Polish-Estonian relations. Why? 
because I'm a Polish American born, raised, and educated in Poland. And also, from, as mentioned, from 2004 to 2006, I was asked to serve our country, the United States, in the capacity of United States Ambassador to the Republic of Estonia. So I truly have a great experience and understanding of different cultures, different points of view, different heritage, and I'm able to hopefully share some of that with you. On a lighter note, <laughs> um, understanding different people, different cultures, different communities, it is a lot easier to do that when you understand the native language and how to pronounce one's name. So when I arrived in Estonia, and I arrived in Estonia with my two young children, I'm the proud mother of twins. So the, my son and my daughter, in tow, we arrived in Estonia to serve our country. And I decided to enroll the children not only in the international school, which is the school where the diplomats send their children, where they would be exposed to Estonian, Russian, and English, I decided to also supplement their education and decided to enroll my children in the Polish school in Estonia. Well, <laughs> little did I know that I must have made diplomatic history with that because the news reported that the United States ambassador enrolled her children in the Polish school. And so uh, with that, I must tell you that it was extremely well received by the diplomatic community and by the host government and by the Estonians. Who knew? Now, it served my children very well because subsequently as Duke graduates, they of course took Polish as their, as their uh, uh, language requirement at Duke. And uh, my daughter subsequently majored in Russian, so it did, it did serve them quite well. Now getting back to what does Poland and Estonia actually have in common? Well, one thing we, we can see on the map over here, they are both on the Baltic Sea. They're both in Northern Europe, and they both occupy land that is between Russia and Germany. And I uh, frequently mention that in life, there are very few things you don't get to choose. And one of them is who your neighbors are. So that applies to Poland and Estonia. In the last 100 years, both of the countries have experienced periods of independence, periods of foreign occupation, and both have periods of struggle for freedom and democracy. And most important, self-determination which actually is something we long for as humans, so it really is critical. They both entered the 20th century as part of the Russian Empire. They gained their independence from Russia after World War I. But then, both suffered the violence and the terror of the Second World War. And for almost 50 years, they agonized under the Soviet yoke and under the scrouge of communist rule. With the decline of the Soviet power in the early 1990s, both of the countries seized the opportunity to regain their rightful independence. And since that time, they actually have become closer in their relationships. Both nations have a similar outlook in absolutely just about any issue. There are no outstanding conflicts or concerns between the two of them. They collaborate on just about every level, including economic, cultural, political, military, and academic. Poland is one of Estonia's most important trading partners. The Poles sell to the Estonians chemicals and metal industry products. 
as well as various equipment and automobiles. Now in turn, the Estonians export to Poland machines, timber, metal, and other products. So within this framework, which is called the Three Seas Initiative, and the Three Seas refers to the Baltic Sea, and uh, down below, and I apologize that this map doesn't have it, that we have the Black Sea and the Adriatic Sea. So it's called the Three Sea Initiative. And these countries that are in that block enhance infrastructure, energy, economic connectivity, and they have a platform of joint products, uh, uh, projects and cooperation. The next way that they interact with each other is Via Baltica. Via Baltica is actually a road that goes from the Czech Republic through Poland to the Baltics. They also interact with each other through rail Baltica projects. And this is to help develop, as it was to help de develop Estonia's transportation infrastructure, tying it to Poland and all of Europe. But also, it's not just on ground, it's also by air. Polish airlines, LOT, manage on having strategic partnership with Estonia and Estonia's Nordica Airlines. And this generated an enormous improvement through the years on air transportation. Now, Estonia, Estonia actually, and this may be new information to most of you, Estonia leads the world as far as digitalization in the world. And in the field of information technology, they are the poster child from the world. And Estonia still remains and is called a serious partner called the Baltic Tiger. Estonia is the most advanced digital society in the world. Skype was a software that was actually created by Estonians. The Estonian government was the earliest adapter of blockchain technologies, which we all now take for granted. Of interest is 99% of the public services in Estonia are available online. And when we say online, we're referring to Estonia, meaning everything's on your phone. Your whole life is on the phone. It's absolutely fascinating. So Estonia, it's normal for the citizen in Estonia to vote on their phone and even there's an opportunity, at least there was, I, it, where you could change your vote until a given cutoff date. And I'm thinking, <laughs> okay, I know we're in Florida, so there's also, <laughs> okay. So you can vote on your phone, e-voting, and you can pay your taxes on your phone within one minute. That's how advanced they are. Now, it, it didn't come without a price. In 2007, the world experienced what is known as the first official cyber war. And that happened when, this is again, Estonia, which is an e-government, absolutely paperless government. Where from your children's medical records to grades to you paying for the manicure to the, uh, to the parking, all the technology was Estonian and then we just, some of it we take for granted. But in 2007, out of the blue, all of a sudden, it stopped. The first official cyber war happened when the government had closed down and most, in, within a second, the banking sector, the medical the sector, everything, the educational sector, all of a sudden, everything stopped. And, um, of course, the United States and everyone came to see, oh my goodness, what happened? And to this date, NATO's, and NATO has their Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, to this date is still in Estonia. So I'm sure that's all new information to you because it is such a tiny country with a tiny population, and yet they have been ahead of the class in the world on, on technologies. 
Now, energy security. Energy security has been also a very significant aspect of the Polish-Estonian relations, especially in the context of reducing dependency on Russia on all the different energy sources. So both of the countries through the recent year, ha years have diversified their energy supplies, and they've invested heavily in the infrastructure projects, such as the Baltic Connector Natural Gas Pipeline, which is a bi-directional pipeline between Estonia and Finland. And um, of note, in very recent times, those who follow current events, all of a sudden there was an explosion under the Baltic Sea and somehow, somehow, this pipeline managed to um, um, being tampered with, and uh, and uh, different communication systems that were right by the pipeline. This happened just fairly recently, and currently Finland is is officially um, exploring to how that could have happened, or as we say, who could have made it happen. Then, and what was the reason for that happening? To cut off that. So, and of course, Poland and Estonia are both very, very strong advocates of the, of the European Union, which they joined in 2004. And they're very committed to the principles of democracy, principles of rule of law, and human rights. They work together with the EU to really advance their common interests and to contribute to the development of the EU policies. The Estonians and the Poles believe that the, their full integration into the EU at many levels could possibly shield them from Russian aggression. Now, aside from security, cultural affairs. Cultural affairs are also extremely important as far as how they collaborate between the two countries. They're very different, their, their language is different, their culture is different, their, everything is different except kind of as their geography. So, on the cultural affairs, uh, every two years, the city of Narva in Estonia holds an international shopping competition and for the new talent that is found through the world. And as you all know, Chopin is the most beloved of the Polish romantic composers and piano virtuosos. And of note, as, uh, as, as was mentioned, Lady Blanca Rosenstiel is the president of the Chopin Foundation here in the United States. So uh, Chopin has a wide reach to the world, but including into Estonia and Narva. Now, the city of Narva in Estonia is the easternmost border of NATO. This is where, through the city of Narva, where the international border between Estonia and Russia is. So, again, the easternmost border of NATO runs straight through the city. Now, what is really of interest is the fact that this international border between Russia, Estonia, Russia, NATO, Russia, EU, has never been ratified officially. <sighs> Nothing needs to be said. It's never been ratified. Okay. Other cultural activities that, that link uh, Estonia and, and, and Poland. Speaking of Chopin, piano making is an Estonian art going back to the 18th century. Fascinating, who knew? But during World War II and the subsequent occupation of Estonia, the production obviously was ceased and the factories were destroyed. In 1995, a doctoral student in New York at the Juilliard School of the Arts, world famous school, happened to have been Estonian. And he took over the Estonia Piano Factory. An Estonia Piano Factory produces grand pianos that are sold in the United States. They're sold in the majority of the world. And they are ranked in the highest tier of quality based on rankings in the piano industry. 
So another link of music, composer, and, uh, and piano making. So, and the name of the piano is Estonia. It's truly like the country. So there is a robust and continuous effort to bring Polish literature to Estonia. And there are also Polish exhibits and shows at Estonia's leading museums. So that includes the General Johann Leutner Estonian War Museum, the Estonian Art Museum, and the Estonian National Museum. Now the Poles reciprocate, and the Poles uh, reciprocate in kind, and they bring Estonian exhibits to Poland. And for instance, in October of 2021, the second World War Museum in Gdańsk in Poland a stage a project on the Polish-Estonian relationship between the wars. And some very important exchanges actually take place between the two countries in reference to history and culture. So between Poland's Institute of National Remembrance and Estonia's Institute of Memory, which they both investigate and preserve the memory of human rights violations, oppression, persecution, and crimes against humanity by the communist rule. Poland and Estonia have common history, and it's relevant to today. Both Estonia and Poland became a battleground for Germany and the Soviet Union. World War II may seem really far away from us, especially as we're looking at current events, but not for these two countries, and not for the people who live in these two countries. Here's something of interest. The last Russian troops that left the grounds of Poland was on September 17, 1992. Exactly 53 years after Stalin, who joined Hitler to invade the Republic of Poland. Now, Estonia is also an amazing thing because Estonia only regained its rightful re-independence in 1991 after World War II. And the last Russian troops that left the grounds of Estonia were in 1994. So World War II history in Poland and Estonia is not there. It's part of memory, but it's part of the present. So it certainly shapes how they think of current events. Now going a touch into history again. As you heard, I am born in Poland in Warszawa. I am a child of a concentration camp survivor and slave labor survivor. History has affected my life. I lived under communism. At the beginning of World War II, Germany and the Soviets, as everyone here knows, signed the non-aggression pact. And they decided then to divide Poland, which was a three free and independent country. And within 17 days, Germany from the west and Russia from the east invaded Poland. And they partitioned it. 34 million people lost their freedom. And ultimately, minimal 6 million people over a fifth of Poland's pre-war population perished. Now my family, who are Catholic, 
fought in the Polish underground during the war. They risked their lives to shelter Jews. And for that, they're recognized by Israel as righteous Gentiles. They also fought in the Warsaw Uprising of 1944 to defend their city. And in 63 days of the Warsaw Uprising, 250,000 people died, mostly women and children. After 63 days of fighting in the Warsaw Uprising, my father and his entire family, so his parents, his siblings, they were all arrested and taken to Flossenburg concentration camp. My father was prisoner number 23,504. His mother and his sisters were taken to Ravensburg concentration camp. By the grace of God, they all survived. My father and my grandfather were liberated by General Patton's Third Army. My grandmother and my aunts were unfortunately liberated by Stalin's Red Army. They were brutalized by their Soviet liberators before they were released again and returned to their homeland. So Poland suffered the greatest population loss in Europe. Nearly half of Poland's territory was forcibly annexed by the Soviet Union. The capital of Warsaw was more completely destroyed than any other European city. Now, Estonia, Estonia also suffered terribly because Estonia also had multiple occupations in their history between Germany and Russia. Estonia lost almost 25% of its population during World War II. So Poland and Estonia were victims of two totalitarian regimes in their history. Hitler's fascism and Stalin's communism. Let us never forget that both Germany and the Soviet Union slash Russia are responsible for crimes against humanity. So in this region that you see, history never goes away as we turn on our televisions and see. So shifting a little bit into where we are now in the security aspects of current affairs. Unfortunately, such matters are not simply the stuff of history. Geopolitical dilemmas remain absolutely the same. Russia has emerged again openly threatening the world with a nuclear war and pursuing once again the reoccupation of former Soviet countries and beyond them. The Poles and the Estonians, who both have borders with Russia, is why I'm leading that map up, because we forget that both Poland and Estonia have borders with Russia. And they really listened when Vladimir Putin said, quote, Russia's borders do not end, unquote. I'll repeat what he said. Russia's borders do not end. Putin's vision of the future could well include remaking not just the Soviet Union, but the entire Russian Empire. So, to preserve their independence and freedom, currently, both Estonia and Poland 
they've joined NATO, and they've collaborated very closely with the United States, as well as other NATO allies, on defense and security matters, including joint military exercises and contributing to the alliance's deterrence and defense posture in Eastern Europe. Both Estonia and Poland share membership in the EU, which means they cooperate on various, once again, regional and global issues with trade and economic matters. Both countries regard the United States as their primary partner. And I can tell you that the United States sees my former diplomatic post, Estonia, and my former birthplace, Poland, as frontline countries in the struggle to deter and contain Russia's aggression. So the war in the Ukraine has further clarified the threat from Moscow for everyone now and brought to light the importance of the frontline states in the security, actually, of the entire free world. The Kremlin's aggressive and absolutely illegal actions have ramped the intensity of the regional cooperation. At this point, virtually all Western democratic states in the former Soviet bloc including the successor nations of the Soviet Union itself, have drawn much closer, both in their multilateral and in their bilateral relations. And this, of course, includes the relationship between Estonia and Poland. Security arrangements are not surprisingly the, the, the important facet of the Polish-Estonian cooperation. Poland actually frequently, and this was already during the time uh, when I, as I was serving overseas, Poland frequently dispatches its aircraft to defend Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania airspace as part of the Baltic air policing mission. Both Estonia and Poland currently advocate for stronger NATO eastern flank they jointly participate, again, in the Three, uh, three uh, Seas Initiative. And the Three Seas Initiative is 13 states in the EU, from the Baltic Sea to the Adriatic to the Black Sea. They continue to create energy, digital infrastructure in the region, and this is all a form for the collaboration of the Visegrad Triangle, which is a triangle between the northern states, the Baltic nations. In January of 2023, in Estonia's capital in Tallinn, nine European, so that's now, nine European governments, including Estonia and Poland, signed a pledge to provide the Ukraine with unprecedented levels of assistance, including heavy weaponry, and for the purpose of pushing back Russian forces and to ensure that the Ukrainian battlefield ultimately is victorious. Since the war broke out in the Ukraine, Poland has become a host country for over one and a half million Ukrainians. And on the side note, this isn't that the government is paying for everything. The citizens of Poland have taken families in. 1.5 million refugees from the Ukraine are currently in Poland. Now, Estonia, a much smaller country, with a population of barely over a million itself, has taken over 67,000 Ukrainian refugees. Now that seems like a smaller number, 67,000, but based on population per capita, it is more refugees actually they took in than Poland. 
So in summary, almost given their geographical location, Northern Europe, and their shared interest in regional security, Poland and Estonia will do what they can to both support the Ukraine and deter Russia from committing any further acts of aggression. So in conclusion, both Polish-Estonian relations are rooted in history, they're firmly anchored in the present, and they're oriented towards the future, and a future one of freedom, independence, and national self-determination. Both countries are and will re remain critical to the United States' as allies, as well as they are extremely friendly states to the United States, not only militarily, but also culturally and historically. With that, I thank you, and I'm available to answer questions. Yes, sir. Estonia. Excuse me. Estonia. 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 Well, obviously, there's a difference in size, a difference in population, and, and a difference in, in, in finances between the two countries. Uh, but facts are that you have the NATO and the European Union border bordering Estonia. So geography matters. Now, Poland is, uh, is truly uh, engaged right now as being the leader and everyone is helping with that in order to do whatever is necessary to make sure that Russia does not become more aggressive and to give as much aid to the Ukraine as, as possible. Uh, both are committed equally, equally with, their, uh, with their finances, with their people, with their governments, with their, uh, they're on the same page. They're just different in size and therefore different in capacity. And on the note of, of a tourist, whoever has not been in either Poland or Estonia, it's on your must-to-do list. And Estonia is easy because you can take, if you're taking a tour on one of the cruise ships, you just stop for a few hours in Tallinn and you will be, oh my. Ma'am. Thank you, Ambassador, for your, for your presentation. Just a very quick question. Um, I think that the Ukraine what about Lithuania and Latvia? I mean, how, yes. how do they relate into this sort of like relations between Estonia and Poland? They should also be at the very front. Uh, um, yes, it's a little bit more complicated for those two countries because of, of, of history. Uh, but yes, basically everyone in, in, uh, in all of Europe is on the same page on, on, on current events, um, on the current events in reference to the Ukraine. Everyone's on the same page, so we, but it's a little bit more complicated in their history. Yes, sir. Oh, please put the mic. You just mentioned the, uh, uh, the situation in Poland. I just came back from Poland, and it seems to me, honestly, that the love story between Poland and Ukraine is over. Like you see it in the streets, and actually the government of Poland also, because of tremendous tension. Uh, there is actually a war between Poland and Ukraine when it comes to agriculture. How would you describe that? I'm just curious. I, 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 yes, that's, a, that's a, a, a very valid point, but that's not... Um, yes, you still have to be... You have your own country and you have to be able to have trade and you have to feed the people in your own country regardless of, of other things. Um, it's not just one issue. 
they have a common enemy. And so the common enemy, it's positioning now, will Russia with the wheat to de decide where it's going and is Poland going to give in or the Ukraine? It, it's ex those are at the diplomatic and governmental levels. They will come to some, uh, uh, some agreement. But no one is backing down against the main aggressor in this, wheat or no wheat. <laughs> and no one is backing down that, oh, well, dear Russia, yeah, it's, it's all good. We're, we're best friends again. That's not going to happen. Yes, and I think this is the part of diplomacy that, that we, we uh, don't normally speak about. We never, we never agree 100% with anyone, another human. Now, at the government level, we don't agree with our allies 100% on everything. So you try to decide what is your goal, how am I going to get to the goal that's my goal, and how am I going to work with as many people or on many subjects? And sometimes I have to give in a little in order to achieve my ultimate goal. Well, I was wondering if you could speak a little more about this 2007 cyber war and what lessons we might draw as we enter a more digital and confrontational age. So, um, thank you. That is a, a very uh, important, complicated, but simple. We have to be one step ahead of the bad guys. So that's where technology has to, has as uh, many preventive uh, steps to prevent people from, from creating harm. And so you need to be one step ahead of the bad guy in technology. So all your measures of cybersecurity at every single level, it's to, it's, Technology is advancing, and both the good and the bad guys. And technology is used by for good and and for bad, right? So you just have to make sure that you're one step ahead. And that was a surprise to the world, and certainly was a surprise to Estonia. And the backstory on that, why it happened then, and is um, his history is very rich in most of Europe, and. Um, when I arrived at Post, um, there was a situation where a private citizen on their private land put a statue up uh, that resembled an SS soldier. But a private citizen on their private land. And that became um, problematic. Uh, because most people didn't agree with that. I finished my, my stay at the diplomatic post over another statue, and it was a statue of a soldier that was a Russian soldier. And that statue of the Russian, Russian soldier was positioned in the middle of uh, Tallinn in front of the, uh, one of the main um, museum libraries and where the bus station was and was quite problematic for the city authorities because it was always vandalized and they needed to spend extra money to secure it and there were always problems and traffic jams and, and history. And they made a decision at one point to take that statue of uh, the Russian soldier and move it to, to the park where they had statues. And all of a sudden, the whole government closed down because of a cyber war. So statues matter. Um, I'm trying to formulate the question, but uh, you know, Germany's strength has always been its industry, and they've relied on their so, so you know their their um, I guess their manufacturing, and their manufacturing relies on um, their uh, ability to get uh, fuel, and um, and also on their demographics. And it looks like Germany's population, um, you know, their birth rate is declining and everything, and their ability now to get uh, fuel is also in jeopardy. Whereas Poland, it looks like their birth rate is being sustained. And Poland, this last winter, they were able to survive without, because of the weather cooperated, without the fuel from Russia and everything. So do you see maybe Poland replacing Germany as, in a sense, like the powerhouse of Europe and with their industry and their population and, and their ability to kind of find alternative fuel? 
Um, I, I absolutely agree with you that uh, fuel keeps us going, and it's critical, and that's where decisions in the long term need to be made in the future. Uh, the decisions that Germany made in reference to its uh, pipelines and fuel sources coming, you know, and their interaction with Russia turned problematic. Uh, whereas um, Poland still has an ability to uh, to create other solutions, and uh, I think the governments in Europe are and should be focused on making sure that they're as energy and we, the United States, as energy independent as we possibly can be, because energy has has and can, can and has turned into a weapon. Ambassador, thank you for uh, your lecture. Uh, my question is that recently election in Poland, and uh, I would like to ask, how do you think the recent elections might have impact the relation between Poland and Estonia in the future? And I, I firmly believe that in countries that are democratic countries, they work it out. And in reference to governments that require coalitions, which both Estonia and Poland do, in order to create a government, you need a coalition. It's, it's a little bit more problematic, but eventually it happens, right? And uh, we're very fortunate, as just discussing before this lecture, that we actually do have process and democratic process where people have to come together in order to create a government, as opposed to someone just coming in, it's going to be my way and the rest of you don't matter. So it's, uh, we're still waiting for the outcome, and, and we'll see how the coalition forms. Uh, but uh, it, they'll have a government, and it'll all align. We just have to wait. Yes, sir. Poland, as I understand it, has been very effective in preventing illegal aliens and people from the Middle East to infiltrate the country. What has Estonia done? Because you have to have your heart of your culture to prevent your population from being destroyed and your whole culture changed and lost. And, and absolutely, and um, both Estonia and Poland, uh, they different immigration laws, and since they both are part of the EU also, it's uh, different, and I'm not an expert on that, but both uh, are making sure that they're not opening their borders to everybody. Because you can't maintain a country if you do not have a language and a culture or, and or a religion, as you have mentioned. And um, what saved a lot of countries in the world is their difference, right? So Estonia has such a complicated <laughs> language uh, that kind of saved them even through the years of, of Soviet occupation. And um, in order to become an Estonian citizen, you still have to be able to maneuver through the Estonian process. Uh, so um, language matters, culture matters, religion matters in order to keep the identity, as you said. And, and both Poland currently uh, has recently been uh, known to say in front of uh, the United Nations, look at us, <laughs> we don't have a problem with terrorists. You've, you, I'm sure you're referring to that, uh, that interaction uh, last week or the week before at the United Nations. Well, Ambassador Bush, thank you so much for a very enlightening talk this evening. Um, I'm sure I certainly have questions for you that, that we, we could continue to explore, and I, I hope the rest of you as well. Uh, at the reception, uh, which is just behind us, but uh, before then, uh, as a token of our gratitude, we'd like to make a little presentation for you from all of us here at, uh, at UM and uh, in the Miami Dade community. So please, Nick. Thank you. Thank you. Of course, thank you. Thank you. Oh my God, Thanks, everyone. Please stay and have some burgers and a yeah. glass of wine, and uh, we can talk some more. Thanks very much for coming out tonight. Appreciate it. Oh my God. Yeah. Those are absolutely stunning.